Okay, for the next talk, we are it's a pleasure to have Stefano Antonini, who will be telling us about cosmology from random entanglement. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, of course, to the organizers for this beautiful conference and for inviting me to give a talk. So today I'll be talking about work with uh, Martin Sacieda, who's uh, in the audience, and it's um, Paul Zucker Brandeis and Brian Swingle. So in this talk, there will be, we'll see some ideas that overlap with the talk that Ying gave yesterday, but we'll see that the setups are actually quite different in this case. So let me start by saying that ADS-CFT and holography in general taught us very many interesting lessons about quantum gravity. We learned a great deal about, for example, information problem and the relationship between geometrical observables and um, um, quantum information theoretic observables in the boundary. But there is still a big piece which is missing, uh, which is the fact that if we want a quantum gravity theory that describes physics in our universe, we should really be able to describe a cosmological universe. And ADS-CFT is not immediately uh, obvious how to do this. And so I would say that I don't mean to do any review of why is it complicated. I just want to mention some very intuitive reasons why describing cosmology within ADS-CFT is quite complicated. The first one is that ADS-CFT describes quantum gravity in a universe with a, cos a negative cosmological constant. But our own universe, at least in the simplest possible models that you can build of cosmology, has a positive cosmological constant that drives the current acceleration of our universe. Another reason is that asymptotically the space sense is in, are in some sense um, asymptotically empty. And by that, I mean that if you go close to the boundary, there is not really a contribution to the stress tensor that doesn't fall out. So the only real contribution that sustains these universes there is a negative cosmological constant. But FRW universes, like the one uh, that describes our own, are homogeneously filled with stuff, with matter, with radiation, and they are homogeneous and isotropic. And the last one, which is really a consequence of the previous two, but uh, I would say it's a very intuitive feature of why cosmology is complicated, is the fact that uh, in FRW universes, we generally don't have, even if you have a negative cosmological constant, we don't have an asymptotic boundary where to define a dual CFT. So it's not very clear how to use a DSCFT or holography in general to describe cosmology. And there have been a lot uh, of different approaches, of course. I said to hear some of the authors and I apologize to those of you that worked on this field as well, but uh, I guess it would have taken a whole slide just with names. And I broadly grouped these approaches in two different categories. The first one is trying to describe cosmology directly with a positive cosmological constant. This is really very interesting, and uh, it is something that aims at really describing our own universe. And the drawback is that it's quite hard, and you probably need some new ingredients, some new framework for holography in order to describe, for example, the sitter. On the other hand, uh, there is another approach. Uh, which tries to make a first step by describing negative cosmological constant cosmologies. These are generally big bang, big crunch cosmologies. And one can hope that since you have a negative cosmological constant, in some sense, these are a little bit simpler to understand. And then you can maybe learn some general lesson about how to describe cosmology in a DSCFT. And uh, it's also not completely excluded, I guess, that uh, our universe has a negative cosmological constant, but let's not go into details of that. All I want to say is that these negative lambda cosmologies could teach us some interesting lesson about cosmology in holography. So the approach I will be discussing today is, I would say, on the second kind of a, um, a broad approach. The idea is that we want to simplify our problem as much as we can and try to learn some general lesson. And so we have a negative cosmological constant and we drop any hope to have a, a realistic cosmology that looks like our universe because we have a closed cosmology, uh, which is inhomogeneous, and I'll explain what I mean by that. And it's time symmetric, so it has a big bang in the, in the past and a big crunch in the future. So the advantage of doing this is that there is a very well understood bull setup, and this bull setup is a saddle of a gravitational Euclidean path integral. And the nice thing about this is this is generally what we, we used to do in holography. 
And there is also a dual description, which is quite well understood in terms of some entangled state of two CFTs. And finally, uh, the fact that we have such a simple setup and a Euclidean path integral associated with it help us to try and study how these cosmologies encode in the dual theory, and in particular, try to understand the features of the bolt boundary map in this case. So let me mention that, as I said, this is motivated by the idea of cosmology and trying to uh, understand maybe how a cosmological universe is encoded in the dual CFT. But uh, what we learn by this model is also something that goes a little bit in a different direction, which is really trying to understand how different patches of space-times are encoded in a DSCFT. Uh, sorry, disconnected patches of space-time are encoded in a DSCFT. And in particular, the role of these closed universes in the Euclidean path integral for gravity. And I will comment a little bit about this at the end. So what I will do now is, first of all, describe the bull description that we have and the corresponding dual boundary state. And then uh, we will delve into some detail of how you can actually map this bull state to, sorry, this Boolean uh, theory to the corresponding boundary theory and see how the map that encodes this cosmology into the boundary is actually non-isometric. And then I will comment a little bit about uh, the implications and interpretations of these results. Okay, so this will be our playground for the day. Uh, this is our bulk setup. Here I glued to, to the bottom the Euclidean geometry to uh, the corresponding Lorentzian geometry that you obtain when you analytically continue. And this blue line is the reflection symmetric slice on which the initial state of the space time is uh, defined. So you have the initial data and that you can then evolve in Lorentzian time. And let me unpack a little bit for you this, this feature. So let's start from the Euclidean. Uh, saddle that we're considering. The way you should think about this is having uh, two thermal idea space times and glue them to each other along the trajectory of a dust shell. By dust shell, I mean this is a spherically symmetric distribution of pressureless matter. And you should think of it as having a very large uh, ball of dust where each uh, this dust is just formed by single particles of, uh, of dust. So the way you do the gluing is taking these two uh, thermal idea space times and then put a dust shell in the middle and impose um, Israel junction conditions in order to have a consistent solution of Einstein's equations. And these Israel junction conditions give you the trajectory of the shell in the Euclidean geometry, which is just given by this simple equation where M here is the total mass of the shell. Okay, let me mention that what we're interested in, he in here is having a large preparation time. So these Euclidean temperatures are taken to be large. And the reason for that is that we want to be below the Hawking page transition, such that the dominant saddle is this one with a thermal ADS space time, rather than to uh, ADS black holes glued to each other. And the setup with ADS black holes is also very interesting. It was studied by in papers before. I mentioned here some of the authors that work in similar setups. Uh, and again, there are uh, certainly more than these. And uh, so the, the black hole case is also very interesting. It can be used to build microstates of geometrical microstates of these uh, black holes. But uh, in this case, we would be interested in being below the Hawking page transition. So the way you should think about this little circle here is r equals zero. Okay, so what is the state that is prepared on this time reflection symmetry slice? We see that we have two initial slices for two auxiliary, what we call auxiliary ADS space times, this one and this one. And then we have something in the middle, which you should think of as having an ADS space time cut off a large radius and glued along the trajectory of the shell to another ADS space time cut off at the same large radius. Now, if you hold this set up in Lorentzian time, nothing particularly interesting happens in the ADS space times. They're just pure ADS space times with some uh, gas of particles in it. And in the closed cosmology instead, you should think of that as just being inside a collapsing shell. So the shell will collapse, the universe will shrink, and you will eventually hit a big crunch singularity. Each one of these two patches of cosmology you should think of as the interior of a collapsing shell for, that forms a black hole. One more thing that I want to mention here is that in this setup, of course, you have bull fields. 
and these bull fields will have entanglement, which will be between the two auxiliary DS space times and the cosmology. And I will comment a little bit more about the specific structure of entanglement. So this Euclidean saddle should be seen as dual to some Euclidean path integral that lives on this boundary and define the state of two CFTs living on the two asymptotic boundaries of the auxiliary DS space times. And let's see what this dual state is. So here I just add the one dimension. So in this picture, we have this line and this corresponds to having this cylinder here. So this is the path integral for the CFT. And you should think of the state prepared at the reflection symmetry slice here as something in some sense similar to a thermophile double. So you have a thermophile double where in the Euclidean pass you insert some operator. If you take this operator to be uh, the identity, then this is just the thermophile double. But the type of operator that we want to insert is the one that creates the shell. And that will be a very heavy operator. But that I mean is an operator that is formed by a spherically symmetric distribution of, for example, primary operators. And you want a large number of them in order to have a very heavy shell that back reacts on the geometry. So this must be an order and square number of primary operators. So these states are called partially entangled thermal states. Uh, they've been vastly studied in the literature by Hermann and friends and also by many other authors. And, um, right. and um, one thing I want to mention is that, again, we're taking this to be a low temperature, so large beta, beta L and beta right, which implies that the left to right entanglement between these two CFTs at the time of reflection summary size is small, is order one. And by order one, I mean that it's not parametrically large in N, but it can be uh, made larger, as we will see in a second, but it cannot be made uh, parametrically large in N. Yes? If in the setup, you will want the operators to contract between this circle and another circle in the top part of the diagram. Yes. Right. Now, how do you ensure that? I mean, you, you would like the operators to carry a conserved charge, but it's a global symmetry rather than. Well, I mean, how do you ensure that the operators don't contract with each other and they contract with the conjugates in case? Right, right, right. Yeah, you have to ensure that. If, for example, you can maybe have some different masses, but uh, in certain in a approximately spherically symmetric way, or you can consider that if you have some kind of global charge, and maybe it's then broken by uh, non perturbative effects. So you should just consider setups in which the two contract to each other. It's not clear that there is, um, you're basically taking this, the one point function over the vacuum state of this operator to be vanishing. Okay, so we have this order one entanglement between the two CFTs and you want the um, um, entanglement of bull fields. And this implies that entanglement of bull fields is also small because you basically have thermal yes, space times at low temperature. Okay, so we have this bull setup and this dual interpretation in terms of uh, two CFTs. And what I want to mention here is a couple of comments before studying how the cosmology is encoding the dual CFT. The first comment is that um, something that simplifies the calculation is to take the mass of the shell to be uh, very large. And the reason for that is that if you take the mass of the shell to be very large and you study the equations of motion, this uh, Euclidean time elapsed by the uh, shell becomes very, very small, which implies that you have roughly a gluing of two thermal ADS space times along a point. It's not exactly true, but it is approximately like that. And this implies that the bulk state in what I will from now on call the left and right system factorizes. What I mean by left and right system, I mean left system is this left auxiliary ADS space times plus this patch of cosmology. And the right system will be the right patch of cosmology and the right idea space, yeah, space time. So in this case, you will just have roughly two thermal idea space times, so and you will have an entanglement only within the left and within the right system, but not cross entanglement, approximately, of course. So this is just useful because you can make calculations explicitly, but the results that I will present uh, might hold also in, uh, in general, more general situations. It's just a, a trick to be able to actually do calculations. The other thing I want to mention is what I mentioned before about having this order one entanglement in the bulk. In general, you can consider more generic states. So you take a PETS and then you insert some light operators, for example, here in certain men in the bulk. And these light operators will generate additional entanglement between uh, within the left and the right system. And uh, so you can 
tune the entanglement separately in the left and right system. And so you can just have a knob to uh, increase the entanglement as long as it remains no parametrically large in N. So we'll see that this is uh, useful to study uh, some properties of this model. Yes. In, how do you understand why the bulk states factorize from the Lorentzian point of view? Does the shell screen high energy modes? Yeah, that, that's probably what you should think of because you have this like very heavy shell very far away. And so you have most of the entanglement localized within uh, the inside of the shell and the other idea space time. You should think of it as a preparation that you play important thing to. Okay, so what this does for you is just giving you knobs to regulate the entanglement in the left and right systems uh, while you still keep it, of course, order one. But you can keep it quite large as long as it's not parametrically large in N. Okay, so now we have this book set up, and the question is. Well, you have this left idea space time clearly encoding the dual CFT, the left CFT, the right idea space time encoding the right CFT. Where is the cosmology encoded or this closed universe? So, the answer to this question is clearly in the entanglement entropy of one of the two CFTs. You want to understand what's the entanglement wedge of uh, one of the two CFTs. It doesn't matter which one because the full state is pure, but let's say for simplicity, the, the left CFT. And if you compute this entanglement entropy, carefully doing a replica calculation, what you find is that if you have a large uh, difference of entanglement between the bulk fields in the right and left idea space times, then the entanglement of the left CFT is given by the minimum between the entanglement of bulk fields in the left idea space time and entanglement bulk fields in the right idea space time. And since the full bulk state is pure, the latter is equal to the entanglement of bulk fields in the left idea space time union the whole cosmology. So what does this mean? It means that first of all, notice that the quantum stream of surface is trivial. Uh, there is no area term. So the only contribution to this formula is bulk entanglement. And I guess here colors are not showing up. Here are supposed to be a blue circle. Um, the idea here is that you just have a, um, the entanglement wedge of the last CFT, including all of the left idea space time. And then everything you have to choose is whether the cosmology is encoded in the left CFT or not. And this depends on the amount of bulk entanglement that you have between the cosmology and the two idea space times. If you have much more entanglement in the left than you have in the right, the cosmology will be encoded in the left. And if the opposite is true, the cosmology will be encoded in the right. Either way, you can see that uh, this cosmology can be seen as an entanglement island in the sense that it's a part of the entanglement wedge of one of the two CFTs, uh, that, and it's disconnected from the rest of the entanglement wedge. Notice that what I will say from now on, one matter if this condition is satisfied, the condition just tells you that you're not in a tie situation. If you're in a tie situation where the two entanglements are very similar, you can only think of the cosmology as being in both CFTs. But the, the statements I will make about a bull to boundary map will hold anyway, just for a two sided bull to boundary map instead of one sided. Okay, so we have this cosmology being some sort of island. And so when islands appear, it's very frequently what happens is that there is a non isometric bull to boundary map and there is a, a state dependent reconstruction of operators inside the island. So what we can ask here is if, the, if this is the case. And in particular, we're interested in studying specifically the encoding of the cosmology into the dual CFT and not of the 2 space times, just because the 2 space times are very simply encoded in the dual CFT. You can use reconstruction like HK, for example. So how do we restrict our attention to the cosmology? We can consider uh, different states in the cosmology where you think of inserting in the Euclidean path of the Euclidean path integral some operator which is heavy enough to satisfy the geodesic approximation, but not too heavy to back react on the geometry. This is just for simplicity. And what this operator does is essentially creating a particle inside this cosmology. And you can just consider different states with different number of particles, for example, in the cosmology associated to different insertions in the CFT path integral. So how do we define then our bull to boundary map restricted to this case, which is uh, very under control? Well, we start with a reference bulk state. And by that, I mean that you fix the state in the 2 ADS space times, you fix the entanglement, and then 
you act in the cosmology, you can think of creating particles, for example, by acting with some uh, bulk cooperator inside this cosmology. Of course, there is a question how you address these operators. Uh, bear with me for a second, I will comment later, but the idea is that there is uh, some structure in the state. Maybe you can dress these operators to the, to the dust shell. And anyway, you can prepare the different, these different states using the Euclidean path interval. And so you can think of uh, having different bulk operators that create these different states. So these are just, imagine them as creation operators for some particle inside the cosmology. What's the dual state? The dual state can be defined as we saw before using this Euclidean path integral. Uh, you will have a Euclidean time order product of the insertion of uh, the operator that creates the shell, the creator that creates the background state, and then the specific operators that create these particles. And this will be the corresponding dual state that we saw uh, constructed here using this Euclidean path integral for uh, the CFT. And then we can define what we call the cosmology to boundary map. What I mean is just a bull to boundary map, which is restricted to the specific set of states, which are a little bit simpler to understand. And it's just the map that maps this bulk state to this boundary state. So now that we have this class of states, we can also ask whether this map is isometric or not. And in particular, the way you ask this is consider different states in the cosmology. The bulk effective field theory that you can define naively there will tell you that these states are orthogonal unless the two insertions that you have are exactly the same, because it's like having a quantum field theory where you have a one particle state or a one particle state or a different particle or say two particle states. So in the bulk effective field theory that you can define naively, this is just um, the gram matrix of these overlaps is diagonal. But then one can ask, okay, if I map the states to boundary states, is the CFT gram matrix diagonal or not? If it is, the map is isometric because the inner products are preserved. But if the, um, this gram matrix of the CFT is non-diagonal, then uh, the map will be non-isometric. So how do you compute this CFT gram matrix? You can compute it using the gravitational Euclidean path integral, as we usually do. The rule here is that you fix uh, boundary conditions with specific insertion that here I call I and J, and then you fill in the bulk with uh, the rules of the Euclidean path integral for gravity to compute this overlap in the CFT. Now, if you do this and you just compute the overlap, what you find is that this gram matrix seems actually to be diagonal. However, this is not quite the case, and this won't come to a surprise to most of you. The reason is that if you try to compute the square of this overlap, so you take two copies of this boundary with insertions i and j, you will have a contribution coming from a Euclidean wormhole in where particles i and particle uh, i in the other boundary can connect to each other, and the same with particle j and particle j. Whereas in this case, of course, i and j cannot connect to each other because you can think of them as carrying some different flavor. So if you take uh, this contribution from this Euclidean wormhole and you take into account normalization and do everything carefully, what you find is that the square of the overlap is given by e to the minus ready to entropy in the right ADS space time plus ready to entropy in the left ADS space time. These are just bulk entropies. And I want to remark here that these bulk entropies are, as I said before, can be made large, but not too large. They're order one. They're not parametrically large in N. And so these corrections to the effective field theory are quite large. This is telling you that the effective field theory cannot compute correctly the overlap of two microscopic CFT states, but it can get some statistics of it. What do I mean by that? I mean that this is the typical size of an off-diagonal overlap for uh, the CFT. By typical size, I mean that there is some kind of averaging going on. This is what often happens in gravity. And the, this type of averaging was studied in uh, a, a slightly different ideas and set up by Chandra Harman and by Sacieta, by Martin. And this idea is that there is an averaging over an ensemble of these shell operators. And I will comment a little bit more about this uh, at the end of the talk. So what we find at the end of the game is the gram matrix in the CFT is non diagonal, but the gram matrix in the bulk effective field theory is, and so this map is clearly non isometric. So it looks like this effective field theory, yeah. Throw out there. Do you mean in the state without the insertion or with the insertion? It, it doesn't matter. 
Okay, so there's no index dependence on the right hand side. No, so this is. Oh, oh sorry, you I mean these insertions. Okay. Um, this is the bulk entropy in the left and right ADS space times. These insertions are inside the disconnected space time, so it doesn't depend on it. There's like some subleading contribution that should depend on what particular <laughs> operator will answer, or you think it really just doesn't matter? Uh, no, in this case, it doesn't matter because you have different insertions that then that just connect to each other, and this is just computing some average over uh, some ensemble, and it doesn't matter which. I mean, there could be in a com UV complete theory some dependence on that, but the, the Euclidean path integral just can compute that. Oh, yeah. I should have mentioned this is um, the off diagonal case. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you take the diagonal case, of course, this is just, just this is one. Yeah. Okay, so this map is an isometric, and it looks like you have large correction to this overlap coming from Euclidean wormholes. And one would be tempted to say, well, the effective field theory is somehow just breaking down, but this ensemble interpretation is really telling you that you, the Euclidean path integral can compute the right quantities in some sense if you ask the right questions, like coarse grain questions. And in fact, if you try to compute, take the CFT, restrict it to some microcanonical band, and then try to compute the rank of these gram metrics using the Euclidean path integral, you just do a resolvent calculation, and that gives you the right answer. It gives you that the rank Matrix, sorry, the rank of the gram matrix of the CFT is upper bounded by the e to the microcanonical entropy. So this is the correct answer. However, if you just try to compute an overlap over two microsys of the CFT, it cannot give you the correct answer. It gives you naively zero, and it doesn't capture these corrections. And I will make some more comments about this and some more interpretation uh, at the end of the talk. So one more thing I want to describe is the fact that in this case you can have also a reconstruction of operators in a, 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 of this cosmology just using a construction using the euclidean path integral similar to the one that we had before but what you find is the cft operator if you want to reconstruct some bulk operator acting in the cosmology the cft operator must be uh, state dependent and the state dependence arises from this, I won't go into the detail of this formula, but arising from this Euclidean time ordering. Because the Euclidean time ordering involves an insertion of different operators that depend on the state, and they must be inserted in the right order in order to, correct, to get the correct microstate. So this seems to be a pretty general thing that arises, a, a connection between non isometry and state dependence. And with these collaborators, we're trying to make this a little bit more precise. And we're trying to prove this conjecture where you have just a little advertisement. We're trying to connect the idea that if you have a global bull to boundary map, which is non isometric, then you must have um, some region in the bulk which can only be reconstructed state dependently, and the vice versa is also true. And if this, and this region must also be causally disconnected from the global boundary. So it must be either behind the rest of a black hole, or for example, in a disconnected universe. Okay, so this is before the summary, my last slide, and I apologize in advance because it will be a little bit speculative, but this is something I've been recently very interested in too, and I would like to pose these questions to all of you and maybe hear your opinions later. So, one could have expected, consider that these pets that we built of two CFTs are very low energy states of two entangled CFTs, that a dual description could have, for example, um, just two pure ADS space times with quantum fields entangled to each other. But what the Euclidean path integral is telling us is that there is actually this closed cosmology. And if you have this closed cosmology, you can compute correct quantities as long as you just ask the Euclidean path integral the correct questions like some coarse grain question like the rank of the gram matrix, for example. Now, these interpretation, these results are compatible with an ensemble interpretation that was discussed extensively in uh, two different features by Chandra Harman and by Martin, and also later by uh, John de Boer, Martin and friends in a recent paper. And the idea is that you should really think, so I won't go into any detail, I invite you to read those beautiful papers, but it, the idea is that you should think of these coefficients of the operator that inserts the shell as random coefficients. Now, there are two possible interpretations maybe of this idea, which are the first one that what the 
Pathintria can do is get some macrostates, some thermodynamic description of the shell, and there are many possible microstates and operators that correspond to the same macrostate. So in this case, it would be an ensemble averaging over microstates, for example. The other possibility is that what the Euclidean Pathintria can do is only compute coarse grain answers. So it can only, for example, consider these um, coefficients smoothed out over some energy window and it cannot capture all the UV details of these coefficients. So it would be, and so for example, you can have just one operator that creates the shell and still have this coarse graining. And so still having an ensemble inter an averaging interpretation. So I think that it would be very, very interesting to understand which one of these features are, is correct and how they relate to each other also. And there is a more general, Maybe two more general couple questions arising in this picture. One of them is, what is really the ontological meaning of this cosmology? Like, is this cosmology, if I give you a microstate of the CFP, is this cosmology there in some sense? If you have a description which doesn't require you a Euclidean path integral, um, I, I don't have an answer to that. It might be that maybe this cosmology is just a trick that Euclidean path integral uses to compute average or constraint quantities, but maybe there is no ontological meaning to it when you have a microstate. And the other question that I think is interesting is what is this telling us about the Euclidean path integral in, uh, in higher dimensions? So is it telling us that it maybe can only compute coarse grain quantities or is it possible that uh, if you consider all non-perturbative corrections then it might be able to also compute uh, microscopic quantities of the CFP and the UV, uh, of the UV completion. I think these are a very interesting set of uh, questions that I would have been thinking about with Pratik and also with Martin. And um, I think that I don't know the answers to these questions, but I think they're very, very interesting. So I'd be happy to hear your opinions after the talk. Okay, so let me summarize. What we found is that there is um, a bull setup where we have two auxiliary ADS space times entangled to this cosmology and a dual description in terms of uh, a partially entangled thermal states of two CFTs. We found that if this bulk entanglement is enough, the cosmology can be thought of as an island for one of the two CFTs, and that the map that encodes the cosmology into the dual theory is non-isometric, and the reconstruction of operators in it is state dependent. I didn't talk about this, but in the paper, we also have a toy model, a, a tensor network toy model of this story that shows you that there is a, non-isometric to nearly isometric phase transition. Um, and this phase transition tells you that essentially if you can have an entanglement in the bulk, which is as larger log n, so not order n, but order log n, then you could encode approximately isometrically to the end states of the cosmology into the dual theory. So this seems a, a pretty interesting question to maybe to understand whether this log n entanglement is achievable without heavy, too heavy back reaction that modifies completely the setup. Yeah, and let me just leave you with some open questions. So uh, I already discussed these questions about the Euclidean path integral and exactly what must be this relationship between non-asymmetricity and state dependence and causal connectivity. And in general, it's a good question, I think, to understand whether or not these features always arise when you try to describe cosmology and holography or maybe specifically in a DSCFT. And I think that it's also very important to understand these uh, precise ways to dress operators within the cosmology, for example, to the feature of the state of this uh, shell, or maybe the, the entanglement to the auxiliary space times could play some important role there. But I don't have much to say about that. And finally, Brian is not here, and I feel like AI art is not uh, cool anymore, but I want to honor the cosmic pets by Brian <laughs> that almost made it to the archive, but we commented it out a couple hours before publishing the paper. <laughs> so thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer questions. I want to understand whether uh, the Hubert space of this closed universe is real now. That's a very good question. That's, That's exactly what I meant when I said here that I would like to understand whether you have a way to just have a microscopic state where there is such a universe. 
I, I don't think it's clear from this picture because what this Euclidean path integral is computing is only average quantities. And it might be that in a fundamental theory, there is just no closed universe. Or it might be that maybe if you have a microstate, there is some description in terms of a closed universe. In that case, the Hilbert space would, oh, real, sorry. By real, you meant non-complex. Sorry, okay. Uh, I don't have any particular insight about that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, in regards to the bulk factorization again, uh, with the shell causing the, the two parts of the cosmology to factor, um, I, I'm a little bit confused. If the shell is only coupled uh, to other uh, degrees of freedom through gravity, how does it say cut off high energy photon modes going through the shell? Yeah. What we see here is that if you have a shell which is very, very far away, that most of the bulk quantum fields, you should think of that preparation of the Euclidean path integral as being done by as being essentially equal to the preparation of a term at the space time with entanglement between the S and one side of the cosmology. And then you have some small part of that evolution, which will be done, you can think of it as some, with some full time dependent Hamiltonian due to the insertion of this shell. And that will create some cross terms. But if you take that time to be very, very small, you can approximately have factorization. Anyway, these kind of results, like all these Euclidean wormhole contributions, they don't depend on that. The only thing that depends on that is having these explicit formulas in terms of entanglement entropy on one or the other side, because in that case, it's only true, these things are only true if you have factorization. But if you don't, you still have contributions like that. So uh, the results should, should be generalizable to the case where that's not true, it's just complicated to do analytically. In the Lorentzian evolution, your shell will collapse to a black hole. Can you say anything about the black hole, the inside, and the same yeah. It's not really a black hole. What I mean is that you should really think of this as, oh, sorry. Right. So the way you should think of this is that you, it's the inside of a collapsing shell and both sides of it are in the inside of a collapsing shell. So it just, the whole universe is shrinking. In particular, the whole evolution of this cosmology, if you try to write it, uh, if you try to look at corresponding idea, space time will be contained within a Wheeler DeWitt patch, and you just have a collapse of the shell that shrinks the universe. But there is not really a, a black hole there. It's, it's more like a cosmological singularity. Ask, uh, make a comment, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you had some uh, entanglement entropy that you used to describe yeah. the states the, on the outside Hilbert space, for right. example, this part here. Yeah. Um, but if you could perhaps take a temperature that is so low that there are very few fields, right? Maybe one or two qubits. Yeah, you could think of that very, very low temperature. So in those cases, it's a little more confusing what uh, describes the, uh, the bulk space. And also, similarly, you could with an end of the world brain here, right? Yeah, you don't have this region at all. And similarly, an end of the world brain here. Yeah, so you only have this region in between, right? Is that what you yeah. have? Really, one well, more similar to what uh, Yang was talking about. Yeah. Um, and where, again, there is no CFT where the, the state lives, right? Yeah, I agree. Like, if, if you include end of the world brain, but I think in that way, I would think of, I, I, I wouldn't know how to think about from an ADSF point of view of this setup, I would think of just having some microstate of this ADS uh, defined by its own time evolution of a boundary state, Euclidean time evolution of a boundary state. And about having a small number of fields, I agree that if you take the very, very large temperature and you don't insert any other operator, then you have a situation where you really have a large breakdown in effective field theory. Sorry, it's not clear the effective field theory breaks down in the interior in any way. Uh, it's, uh, maybe we don't know how to describe it. So right. what I'm saying is that this setup is closely related to other setups where we have a radically different description. Uh, a radically different description because we don't have a, a, a CFT. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree that th those are very interesting questions. Like you could have, uh, I, I don't know if I understand your statement about the fact that if you have very low entanglement between the close cosmology and the and the DS, then you should just consider that to not be there because using these kind of subtles of the you give like the gram example. If you it's very, very yeah. 
the Congress in the United States, no breakdown of Perfect. There is. Yeah, okay, I, I perfectly understand with this. Let me maybe clarify what I meant by breakdown effectivity theory. I mean that if you take the fundamental theory to be the CFT and you use the Euclidean path integral as a low energy effective field theory approximating the CFT, then it computes the wrong answers. It, it tells you that the overlap of the microscope or two microscopic of the CFT is zero when it's really not. It, it might be nearly one. But I agree that that could be that there is no semi-classical reason why this effective field theory should break down there. So it's it's unclear to me too whether like wh why this is happening. That's one of the questions that I meant to ask with the with the factor the last slides about factorization. Like if you have this closed universe, does it tell you if there is a fundamental description of it? The effective field theory should not break down, but maybe it just tells you that it cannot be described using some Euclidean path integral for some safety. So it's a good question to, to understand what that would, would be you'd be completed by. Yeah. Well, maybe, yeah, so you didn't, I mean, this is maybe related to Juan, what Juan was saying, but. You didn't, as far as I could tell, say anything specific about this question of is the Hilbert space one dimensional or, or, or not? Well, I think I did in the sense that. Is it true? I don't know. Or is, is this. I think in this case, if you take the temperature to zero, the Hilbert space is one dimensional. If you don't take the temperature to zero, then the Hilbert space should be uh, the size of the Hilbert state that you should expect is something of the order of the micro canon sorry the the entropy between uh, the entanglement the the yes space time and the cosmology tends to say by itself i mean i guess if it could be entangled with something else it sounds like the hilbert space it better not be one dimensional but... it, it's a good question i i'm not sure in the sense that in well, there are arguments that the birth space should be one dimensional. Uh, I feel like from the opinions I've heard that it's, some people believe it's true, some people believe it's not true. Uh, in this case, it looks like what this is telling you, it's really the fatty Hilbert space of the cosmology should be given by this entanglement, the, spati, the expect, um, effective Hilbert space dimension. Uh, but if you, if you have no entanglement with anything outside, then, then the answer to the CFT, the Euclidean path integral gives you is that it would be one dimensional because you would get the rank of the grammatics to be exactly one. But um, yeah, I don't have anything more insightful than that to say. I think it's a very good question to ask uh, whether or not you can think of that cosmology having actually a large Hilbert space and maybe just not describable using ADS-CFT uh, or this specific setup of ADS-CFT. It's a good question. Where where it doesn't become entangled or whatever. So what Peswan was discussing, or right? the bulk effective field theory makes sense in that limit. I mean, it, it seems hard to represent bulk effective field theory in a one-dimensional Hilbert space, at least not without large areas. Right. But I think that the perspective that Juan was taking, if I understood correctly, is that there is no reason why the bulk effective field theory is breaking down here in the sense that there are like this shell is a very large radius. Everything is low curvature. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's the point of view that Juan was advocating. If you take the results of the Euclidean path integral for the CFT correctly, then it tells you that it's one dimensional. And it tells you that as a low energy approximation of the CFT it would certainly break down, but it's. Seriously, then a failure of operator reconstruction is a failure of both effective field theory because in the end we should do every calculation sure. in the fundamental description. Sure, sure, sure. I agree. For as a low energy approximation of the fundamental description is definitely a breakdown of effective field theory. And nonetheless, this kind of pictures can still give you right answers if you ask coarse grain enough questions. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I the answer here. I'm just yeah, yeah, but yeah, I don't know the answer. I think that the these things that you're pointing out is exactly what I was trying to say in the ensemble interpretation of this story and trying to understand if there is a sense in which this effective field theory doesn't break down. Clearly, it breaks down as a low energy effective field theory of the CFT. I completely agree with that. Uh, but 
apparently there is no reason why it should break down from a semi-classical point of view. So it's it's a good question to understand if there is a UV completion of this theory, just if, if there is, it's not just given by that. Thank you.